in Austin, Texas. Planeet aarde. As science has progressed, as we move toward an understanding of everything in nature, uh, there has been a certain disenchantment of the world. Uh, it used to be that when we saw lightning in the sky, uh, we saw the hand of Jove or Thor. Now, ever since uh, Benjamin Franklin's famous experiment with the kite, we know it's a discharge of electricity from one cloud to another or from a cloud to the ground. Uh, generally speaking, we understand the things that we see in nature, the things we see around us, and uh, why the sky is blue, why the grass is green, in a very naturalistic way uh, without invoking anything supernatural. And nowhere has there been a greater sense of disenchantment uh, than I think our view of living things, ourselves. Uh, since the work of Darwin and Wallace um, in the 19th century, we know how the wonderful adaptation of, of living things, uh, the fact that we can see and hear and walk and breathe and eat, uh, that all, how all these things could have developed without any plan, without any guiding hand, without any benevolent overseer, but through a very long series of breedings and eatings, uh, out of which some traits that were favorable to survival mm -hmm. developed and um, became what we see today. Uh, this is a little discouraging that human beings are not the stars of a cosmic drama that has been planned from the beginning, but are part of a world governed by impersonal forces, a world in which accident plays a large role, a world in which we ourselves, our intelligence, everything we hold dear, does not appear at a fundamental level. That at a fundamental level there are mathematical equations, a rather cold, perhaps dispiriting view. So what sort of consolation can we find? Because I think we can't go back. Living in a world in which there is no longer a nymph in every brook and a dryad in every tree, mm -hmm. what can we find to console ourselves? Well, of course, the answer is different for different people. And I'm glad not everyone chooses to be a scientist because there's competition enough. But uh, one of the things that consoles us, it seems to me, is scientific research itself, the same sort of research that's produced the disenchantment in the first place. Because the results of this scientific research are really quite beautiful. They have a remarkable beauty that to some extent, perhaps not altogether, consoles us for the loss of the beauty that was present in the world when we saw gods and giants and fairies all around us. Uh, in a sense, we're faced with the same sort of disenchantment that faced our ancestors in the time of great geographical exploration. Uh, when what was being learned was not the laws of nature, but just what the world was like, what mm -hmm. there was in the world. Uh, here, for example, is a map of the northeast, what is now the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, if you come from Massachusetts, you'll probably recognize Cape Cod here. Yeah. But um, the person who drew the map really didn't know very much. At the time this was uh, prepared in the early 18th century, very little was known aside from the coastal region of North America. Of the interior. And in the interior, uh, you can see that they've put animals, I, I, some of them are recognizable, like I think that's a antelope of some kind, but others are hard for me to understand. Um, 
it must have been wonderful to be a child, uh, even as recently as the 18th century, and look at a map of the world and see large empty regions like the northern part of Canada, mm -hmm. which is, would be beyond the edge of the map, uh, and to imagine all the strange animals and people that live there, perhaps people with um, strange customs. Uh, you know, Othello, when he talks to, uh, when he explains how he won the hand of Desdemona, explains uh, that he did it partly by describing the travels he's taken to the strange parts of the world where there are anthropophagi, cannibals who eat each other. Um, well, that sense of mystery about the world, how there are great unexplored spaces, is pretty well gone. Uh, today we have a vision of the world which doesn't leave much to the imagination. This is an aerial photograph of Chicago. I think I've got it the wrong yeah. way. It doesn't make a great deal of difference. Uh, and um, you can see clearly all the city streets, and there are no mythical animals here. And actually, this sort of picture can be shown with much greater magnification. I understand it's possible to get satellite photos which um, allow you to see individual automobiles. Or or license plates. And, yeah. Perhaps license plates. Um, and maps like this, like this aerial photograph, now exist for every part of the world. There is no part of the surface of the Earth which has not been photographed in this fashion. And there really is no more room for mystery in this. And that is, that is saddening. Uh, I found a nice quote recently, quoted by E.M. Forster in an essay, uh, by a Lombard physician, uh, Girolamo Cardan, uh, writing in 1571. And he was saying just about what I've been saying. Uh, Card this is Cardan speaking now in 1571. It has been my peculiar fortune to live in the century that discovered the whole world, America, Brazil, countries to the north and east and south. And what is more marvelous than gunpowder, the human thunderbolt, which in its power far exceeds the heavenly. Nor will I be silent about you, magnificent magnetic compass, who guides us through vast oceans and night and storms into countries we have never known. Then there is our printing press, conceived by man's genius, fashioned by his hands, yet a miracle equal to that of the divine. And, uh, but then, after this excitement and exhilaration of all these discoveries, Cardan then goes on and sees the, the negative side, the sad side. Heresy has grown. The arts of life will be despised. Certainties will be relinquished for uncertainty. Uh, he then was reacting to the developments of geographical exploration and technology in the way I'm describing that the human race has reacted to the discoveries of science. This process, of course, continues now. Uh, the work that I and my colleagues do in, in physics is aimed at um, perhaps reaching a final point of understanding, not of solving all the problems of science, that will never happen, not of understanding everything, but of understanding in some fundamental way why things are the way they are, mm -hmm. of reaching a final theory which has in it potentially the explanation of everything we see, even though the world is too complicated actually to explain uh, on the basis of solving physics equations. And in this process, one of the um, things that consoles us is the increasing beauty of our theories as we develop them.